Uh, really excited. Uh, we have a great uh, group of panelists here today. And really quickly, before we get into things, would love to get some names, uh, where you're coming from, and uh, you know your roles at the company, and then we'll dive into it. Crystal, we'll start with you. Hey, hey guys, Brand Innovators. Um, I'm Crystal Hausman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Paris Hilton's 1111 Media. Uh, we cross all, we call ourselves a next-gen media and entertainment company bringing content, community, and commerce all under one roof. So everything across TV, film, audio, consumer products, digital, Web3, the metaverse, publishing, music, all the things. So really excited uh, to be here with everybody today. Awesome. Hey, everyone. I'm Paul Hurricane. I'm the Global Head of Music, Content, and Partnerships at TikTok. Uh, broadly speaking, we look after all the frontline relationships with artists, with record labels, with managers, and we work very closely with the music community to make the most out of TikTok and, you know, have the most success possible on the platform. Hello, brand innovators. Hopefully you'll be patient with me. I lost my voice last night, Ooh. so it was a fun time. <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Definitely worth it. Um, so I'm Carol Diara. Um, I'm the head of marketing for UGG, U -G -G. we're a footwear brand that's transforming into a global lifestyle brand. We were, um, we're beloved in our community, we're beloved by many around the world, and so our main mission is how do we take that love for our boot and make it a true love for our brand. We're really focused on being embedded in culture in the community, um, and social is a large part of how we do that. So I'm excited about the panel. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, as Carol foreshadowed, we're here to talk about social, the position of social in uh, respective marketing mixes. And again, excited to have the conversation. So Crystal, we'll start with you really quickly. Uh, Paris is uh, beloved, as we saw with her mobbing yesterday at Brand Invaders. <laughs> yes. uh, as the CMO of 1111 Media, uh, really interested to talk about really quickly uh, how y'all have turned her social influence into, uh, you know, a brand and how that strategy has spawned into the creation, the growth and ongoing growth of a media empire. So we'd love to have you talk about that really quickly. Yeah, for sure. So obviously Paris on all major platforms, I think we're clocking it. We just hit across the 24 million mark on IG, I think this morning. Uh, we were hovering there Woo! for a while, but Congrats. almost 70, 75, 80 million across all platforms. Um, what I love about Paris, you know, been around since The Simple Life. This year marks the 20th anniversary of The Simple Life. That, let that sit in your brain. Um, she was one of the first people to understand you build a community, a fandom, and a following, and then you can do anything you want. And I think what we really do is, you know, social is often the vehicle in our mix for everything we do with our brand collaborations and how we kind of like start. It's really the genesis of everything we put out into the world and then really activate the rest of the flywheel across all different pieces of the company. Um, you know, social is everything, you know, harnessing that community, engaging with that community, serving them content. Um, and we just, we love it. I'm ex also excited today, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the big headline, uh, we were shortlisted on our amazing campaign with TikTok, the 10-minute TikTok with Hilton Hotels, um, which Congrats. was fantastic if you haven't seen it. Really innovative, and um, we just love... It's such a great piece of content where we really curated an amazing lineup of creators across every genre, bring their communities, amplified with Paris communities, to tell a really compelling brand story for Hilton. Um, and that's just the stuff that we love to do, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. And I love that you Congrats. use it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Lot to Congrats celebrate to there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, natural segue, TikTok. Paul, let's talk about you really quickly. You uh, were very early stage in TikTok. You've been there for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so would love to talk about really quickly as TikTok has evolved into what it is today, um, the way brands position themselves on the platform and how they build communities, which... Uh, you know, Crystal was talking about. Uh, what are some of the pieces of advice you have for brands being there so early and seeing how the platform has evolved, seeing how brands market on the platform yeah. that, you would, uh, that you would share if they're looking to grow their presence and influence on the platform? 
Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting. What fascinates me about TikTok is I think it sort of ushered in a, a new way that people want to communicate with one another, primarily. Like, if you think about... Four, I've been at TikTok for four years, and what really attracted me to the platform was that you could fundamentally see the way people wanted to communicate one, with one another was evolving. And it was evolving in lots of different ways, like the speed at which um, you know, messages could be conveyed, the use of kind of different kind of uh, visual cues, communications, and obviously music was a, a huge part to kind of set the emotion. And the way I, the way I kind of like look at it is that, or the, you know, the thing I always say is if, you, if we were sort of going back to the start of The Simple Life, which scarily was 20 years ago, if, we, if we'd have said, right, we want to make a video to teach you know, everyone in this room how to cook spaghetti carbonara, it would be like five minutes long. But actually, if we'd have said, well, in the future, you're going to learn how to do that recipe in 30 seconds, we'd have all been like, no way. And I think that, to me, has been the fundamental shift with TikTok is it's kind of um, reinvented the way that we communicate with one another, which I think is fascinating. And so when I think about brands, and I, I come from the music space, so my kind of you know, uh, <clears throat> point of reference is artists, I think it's about kind of really uh, listening to what the users are doing and how the users are kind of partaking and you know um, interacting on the platform. So what, with that being said, that doesn't mean you have to necessarily compromise your message, but um, I've seen like artists have so much success in many different ways on the platform. So you've got amazing artists like Cat Burns, who's this incredible singer coming out of the UK who has just slowly and steadily just put up kind of acoustic clips, which has then kind of, you know, kind of seen her explode on, onto kind of like mainstream success. And then you have other artists, um, you know, like Charlie Puth, who will kind of deconstruct a song and, you know, uh, build like, amazing tracks out of turning light switches on and off and all this kind of crazy stuff. So I think it's about the, with what's exciting about TikTok for anybody who wants to kind of, you know, spend time creating on the platform, which we're incredibly grateful for, is the community is there and it's listening and it's waiting to take part and it's waiting to, you know, interact with you. So I think any brand out there, my advice is to kind of spend time on the platform, learn what people like, what people gravitate to, and then work out how you want to put your message into that space. Um, one kind of brand uh, or kind of you know business uh, example, I need to, I'll get the name and <clears throat> I can share it afterwards, but there's this kind of car repair shop in Florida. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the news on this, but there was a car repair shop in Florida that um, just started putting the, the TikTok effect, this cap on all their videos. And now they've blown up and their business is just crushing it. Just from that simple kind of like nod to the community and the culture and what people find funny. So um, yeah, my advice would be, yeah, listen to the community and you know, uh, work out how you distill your message into that. Yeah, that's great. And again, I love the, the use of the word community, uh, you know, shifting from audience to community. And, 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 it, and it really is, you know, it really is a two-way dialogue. For sure. And I guess that's a natural segue to uh, Carol, question for you. So you're the one panelist on this stage who puts a physical product in people's hands and your responsibility as a head of marketing for UGG is to uh, sell that product. So I'm really interested to hear your perspective on how you use building community and social from top of funnel awareness and community building to bottom of funnel, you know, commerce, selling product. We'd love to hear you talk about that really quickly. Yeah, it's a critical part of our flywheel strategy. And we have key um, social moments at each point um, from awareness to conversion to advocacy. And so one unlock that we had is um, every, every fall, people start to talk about uh, when it starts to get cold, right? And about four years ago, Cardi B did a, uh, Instagram. And on her Instagram, she said, okay, everybody, it's Ugg season. It's time to get your Uggs out and put them on right now. And all of a sudden, people just started using the hashtag Ugg season. And so they would, you know, around fall, start to put out their Ugg boots, and they would hashtag Ugg season. 
And we were like, wow, we should really own UGG season, you know? Like, we should be a part of this conversation that our community is already having about us. And so we tried to go back to Cardi B, but then she was way too expensive when we wanted to pay her. Um, so we ended up um, with another, you know, great talent. And actually, Kiki Palmer kicked off UGG season for us this year. And it was, like, fantastic. Like, she's so authentic to her community, but to so many other communities as well. And so as we started um, working on this campaign, so she kicked it off with um, a video about how you can wear UGG basically everywhere. Like if you're at Cannes, if you're at a fashion show, if you're home chilling, basically like UGG is for everywhere. And this video got um, really picked up by the community. And so everybody started to um, emulate this, basically saying they also were wearing their UGG boots everywhere they went. And, um, and then we had an influencer program. So that was kind of like at the top of the funnel, which was like awareness, creating awareness. And then we would have um, kind of influencers that we worked with through affiliates that would be associated with um, more conversion and helping to drive traffic specifically. And then the entire community started to use the hashtag UGG season. And so it took off, and that's when it really became about advocacy. And so that whole part of the funnel really worked from the awareness to the conversion to advocacy in which we had so much um, kind of earned media value, we wouldn't have been able to pay for it. But now we're leveraging our community to do it. And they love UGG so much, and they have so much creativity. So whether it's an influencer or just a, you know, a fan, like they just really love the product and they're so creative in the way that they um, style it and the way that they do it. So community building has become a fundamental part of everything. And I would say that TikTok is where that community is being built today, right? And so people have so many shared interests on TikTok, so you can find so many smaller groups that might, you know, that might enjoy the boots. But now we have sandals, so they'll enjoy the sandals. We were at did an activation at Coachella, and it was all about, you know, our new sandals. And so we're really leveraging TikTok to find these communities and to amplify their voice and their message to create this fandom for the brand. Did you catch that? What I love about that story is TikTok season, or sorry, TikTok season. TikTok season should be the new thing. You heard it here first, everybody, brand innovators. Um, UGG season, right? It was something that came from the community in. It wasn't a bunch of execs in a room saying, like, let's hashtag like UGG season. We've had something similar with sliving, if you're not familiar, the term that Paris coined. It's a mashup of slang and living your best life. And she kind of, you know, that's hot. And her yeah. catchphrase is sliving is is the one that's gaining momentum. I think we're at almost half a billion views on TikTok alone wow. of the sliving hashtag. But we started to realize like we could build a brand around this, right? Instead of just a just a catchphrase. And so this summer we've dubbed the summer of sliving. We have an amazing partnership with FabFitFun. So we put out our summer of sliving box. Um, and we have a big announcement today actually sometime it's going to happen <laughs> around summer of are, sliving. Are we breaking news Exactly. Here? Not yet. Yeah. I'll be nice. in big trouble if I break news. Um, and then... World exclusive. Exactly. And then Hilton Hotels is going to be partnering with us on that campaign. So it's really, again, listening to the community, engaging, really leaning into something that's already there and organic and growing and like them building something around it, right? Because it's, it already came from them. And I think really listening and having a conversation with your brand fandom is so important instead of just talking to them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. And Kara, one of the things that uh, you said that I love, that'll be a segue to Crystal's question here, is that the things you're doing garner a lot of earned media, right? And I think one of the biggest examples of that this year was that Paris did a 10 minute TikTok. And that TikTok and the story behind it permeated just about every channel and uh, you know every media source that is out there. So Crystal, would love to hear you talk about really quickly the intent and the importance of creating on social things that break barriers or intended to live outside of social as part of the strategy. Because 
I think to Carol's point, when you can get a lot of earned media, when you can do things that you necessarily wouldn't be able to pay for and put dollars behind, but it amplifies as such, that's a great move for a brand. So we'd love to hear you talk about that as somebody who was uh, you know, alongside the ride of the 10 minute TikTok. Yeah, no, and I think it's almost turned a little bit upside down on what Paul was saying <laughs> earlier, but not really. And I'll tell you why. So we worked obviously with a fantastic team at uh, Shia Day. Hilton, obviously our partners were, were partnered with us on that too and influential. So a lot of people were, were part of that creative, but you know, the concept was how do you really break through and do something that hadn't been done on the platform and actually can't be done on the platform <laughs> anymore. No more 10 minute TikToks, people. Um, though we could probably find some sort of way. But yeah, you know, the idea was how do you get people to stay Hilton for this day is their global campaign, award winning campaign in in TikTok, in platform and lure them in and pull them through basically a 10 minute ad. And, but how we did it is what Paul was talking about earlier of it was stitched together, a little vignette, so you felt like you were watching 20 second, 30 second TikToks from all manner of creators. We brought in food influencers and fashion and travel and everybody and made sure it was really authentic and it was funny. We poked fun at ourselves. My favorite line in the spot is the ad executive sitting around the table and the guy stands up and why can't we just make regular TV commercials? <laughs> it's the best line ever. Um, but really, you know, doing something, pushing the needle, moving the needle, um, really being innovative and, and leaning into the platform, the creativity. I think what was really important to us in that creative as well was TikTok native directors working on it, TikTok native influencers, creators that were all part of the creative because we wanted to make something entertaining for the community and um, I think we I think we nailed you it. Achieved that. I sure. think it, 200 I think that piece alone I th almost 200 million I think in ad equivalency on that piece of content. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. And that's press covering that. Yeah. And, and if I hot. may if I may just say <laughs> yes. to that it's amazing. It's amazing. And if, and if I may just say to that point like I think that is also an incredible uh, opportunity and what genuinely excites me about TikTok is I don't think we're at all scratched the surface of what's possible creatively. Um, you know, when you think about, I mean, there's so many examples in my time there. When we launched the duet feature, little did we realize that jazz bands around the world are going to duet together and create virtual bands or, you know, the way in which people kind of stitch uh, content together, the way they, you know, go after the storyline in that incredible Creativity, TikTok video. Right? It's the, un yeah. It is literally the best place to get inspired, and there is no wrong way of doing it, in my opinion. Like, if, you, if you're brave and you experiment um, and you take risks, uh, you will be rewarded on the platform. This pigeon continues to sit in this fourth seat, so at some point I'm going to have to <laughs> ask him a question. No autographs. I think you should. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, I'd, I'd be remiss as the global head of music for TikTok if I didn't ask you about music and its contribution to social content. Uh, we commonly refer to it as the texture of the moment. Yep. Uh, music adds uh, value, sometimes understated and underestimated value to content. So would love to get your perspective really quickly on how music has contributed to brand, branded content on the platform and where you see that going in terms of music, brands, and how brands create and connect with audiences and communities uh, based on the music that they put in. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, you know, music on TikTok, obviously, and I'm obviously going to say this, but it's, you know, and it is the most incredible, most important part of all of TikTok, obviously. No, no, um, no, music has uh, plays such a critical role in the platform. And the reason I say that is because the opportunity that it affords every artist um, is incredible. And that's why it's not really hyperbole to say that TikTok really has um, reinvented music discovery. I think 12 of the 14 Billboard number one uh, songs from uh, this year and last have a, a, a TikTok viral moment as part of it. So just to give you a, an example of like TikTok's effect on the, on the wider music ecosystem, which has been a real net positive. And I think the reason why music has, you know, become such a, you know, has such an important part on the platform is that it's allowed, again, when we go back to this idea of like, you know, communicating ideas and, and, and sort of, you know, shipping creative to 
the audience, um, music plays a very, very important part because it helps, like you mentioned, tell the story, set the scene. And, you know, for users, it allows them to kind of convey emotions uh, alongside, like the, alongside the visual part of the content. So, yeah, music's a really, really important, really important part. It, it also creates kind of, you know, an, uh, a, you know, an opportunity to gravitate around something. So, for example, Beyonce's Cuff It was a, a huge moment on the platform recently, and the song has had millions, I think over two million creations. And so, for, so in answer to your question around brands, I think if you're not thinking about music, um, you're missing an opportunity. Because I think one is that music helps, you know, the, the, the user immediately decode like what you're trying to convey. So if you lean into an existing trend or you kind of, uh, you know, are able to work with artists who are, you know, popular on the platform, the community are gonna know that and they're gonna e immediately be able to kind of like, it, it creates a kind of communication and trust like straight away. And then I think also for brands, music is a really just amazing opportunity to encourage, you know, uh, kind of communication and res res reciprocity. Uh, re reciprocity? Sorry, it's too early for that word, I think. But it, it, re it, cr it creates that two-way communication with the users who can also use your music, who can also lead in if, like, you build out a music element to UGG season or whatever. And new partnership right here. Exactly. exactly. It's boring. New we're, music for UGG season. Great. Exactly. And so, so yeah, I think... connections on stage. Yeah. I have connections to an artist that can help you with a track. Exactly. Wow. So, so, yeah. Synergy. <laughs> I hope that helps. Is that answer that helps answer the question? It's, it's also... It's the only sound on platform. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as I say, like music just is such an important uh, communication channel for everyone. So I can't stress enough, uh, you know, uh, brands here and, and people who want to build a community on TikTok, uh, the music is a really key part of how you should be thinking. Yeah, and I think the, the old saying is, um, you know, um, well, like, Copying is the best form of flattery, whatever the actual saying is. But like <laughs> imitation. Oh, imitation, there we go. Like you guys have very much like changed the game in terms of how uh, you know music is integrated on social platforms and like it's it's a very big piece of that texture of the moment. So Carol, uh, as we wrap up here, we'll throw a question back to you, but this is opening up to the um, you know to the group. Influencers need to be part and parcel of any brand's content strategy in 2023 and moving forward, right? So I, I'm interested in talking about really quickly uh, what you're doing within your organization. So you who sells product, you who is partnered with one of the biggest influencers of all time, and Paul, you who is an executive at a platform that influencers drive culture and creative on a daily basis. But Carol, starting with you, we'd love to understand like, what is some advice that you've gained in your role at UGS that you would, uh, you know, put out there and say, hey, this is the right way to work with influencers. Or these are some interesting things that we're testing and we're doing uh, that have been successful for us. Yeah. <clears throat> Our influencer program has been absolutely key, is important of the community building, right? And so not only are the influencers a part of our community, but then their communities are then such a fan of the work that they're doing. So the first thing, obviously, everybody says it, but find influencers that are genuinely a fan of your product, right? So like every single influencer we work with, the first question is, do you wear our product? Do you love our product? And um, there's so many that have a true affinity for it. And then they have great ideas about what they want to do. <coughs> how they want to showcase the product, how they want to work with um, work with the brand. And most recently, we've started um, kind of a live um, event that we do every season, which is called the Feel House. And the Feel House is an opportunity for us to bring our influencers into an in real life person event. Um, and we have one in the fall and the spring. So we just did one at Coachello 
uh, Coachella. And we brought our community of influencers together. And not only were they able to, you know, kind of create content, um, have an experience with our brand, we're able to talk to them about what we're doing in the future. We're able to share product with them. We're able to show them campaigns. And they'll give us real-time feedback, like, oh, no, that's not going to work. Or like, oh, that's hot. Oh, why didn't you change this? Or why did, how, did you think about it like that? And that's invaluable, like bringing the influencers in closer, not just pushing them outwards to leverage um, the content for um, your brand, but to bring them in and to really hear from them. They have amazing insight, creativity, thoughts, ideas. Um, and so that's been a real powerful game changer for us. So every field house, we, all, we always have an influencer component in which we spend like an afternoon with them. You know, like we'll spend four hours with them having lunch, talking to them about everything in our product mix that's coming up. And I would say if you can have an opportunity to really engage with your influencer community, you're gonna be so much stronger as a brand. Everything's gonna be more authentic. Everything we say at UGG is, you know, it's about being real. We can't do anything that seems like it's the brand creating something and then pushing it out. It really has to be organic. It really has to be based on kind of the intuition that's coming from people that are defining and creating culture. You know, and so for us, it's like, how do we constantly be relevant to those that are defining culture? And in order to do that, you have to talk with them, engage with them, listen to them, and kind of really understand their lives. So that's my advice. Smart advice, Carol. Very good advice. You want to weigh in on that, Crystal? Yeah, sure. No, I and I would be remiss if I didn't mention we actually ha we actually do put product into people's hands. So our fragrance sales alone just crossed four billion dollars that's billion with a b number one cookware on amazon Whoa. so you know we're we're selling we're selling we're in commerce too congrats uh, exactly so um no what i love about that we i i can't reveal it yet but we have a major global campaign launching on monday music will be integrated paul will be so happy <laughs> you're gonna call me Woo. big tiktok push um but you know what Everything Carol said, but it really is quintessential, and this isn't news for what people haven't heard before, but those brands that come and want to sit with Paris and I and the creative team and really run through the creative, she understands culture, our audience, everything. I, I always say I've never taken her an idea that she didn't make at least two times minimum better because she really gets it. And I think that's, you know, it's exactly what Carol was saying of really have that engagement don't be that meme where you're handing the influencer a whole script and tell them to shoot at this angle and this thing and it needs to be this long and clip it at that. I think everybody in this who's probably here understands that at this point, but I think it's a great point to always remember. Let the we are at the festival of creativity, so let creativity reign, right? Yeah, agreed. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, you guys are amazing. I want to make sure we give some time for anybody that has any questions. Killer crew up here, no questions. I have a question actually um, that I think is, uh, I know you guys haven't touched on it, but this, when you think about the whole concept of Web3, the premise of it is that it was gonna be this content creator's generation and that, you know, in Web2, where it's social media, um, you know, that we did democratize content, but people didn't actually benefit necessarily, the big companies did. Uh, and the idea during Web3 is that people, people with great followings, like, not like Paris, but even if you can get somewhere close, might be able to monetize that. What are your thoughts on that, and how do you see that coming to play? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, <clears throat> I think it's a really interesting question. I think, like, we are, I don't know exactly, but five, seven years into the creator economy, and I think what's clear to me, and I'm sure clear to everyone on the panel, is it shows no sign of abating or going anywhere. And I think, in, I think, um, I think actually the creator economy is just going to get more and more interesting and more and more fascinating. And I think you've got an incredible, there's not many other spaces I can think of where you have this convergence of people sort of, you know, passion based people kind of, you know, creating kind of communities and then like, you know, pop culture legends like Paris also creating communities, but on a very sort of like respectful and even sort of playing field in some regards with respect to creativity. So I think like, you know, to me, I think we're on the journey in terms of the creator economy. I think it's gonna continue to evolve. 
And I think that, the, yes. Do, do will, people get on TikTok, do the best creators uh, get compensated? Yes, they do, yes. We have like several programs to compensate them. So, so I think we're on that journey. And the, obviously the opportunity on TikTok too for the exposure has helped yeah. many creators create right. a, a huge business. Anything on you guys on that? Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> right here. You guys do some stuff in Web3. Yeah, no, we, uh, Paris has been an early pioneer in Web3 and in in game platforms, Roblox, Sandbox, um, and Sword. So we, we're currently renovating our Roblox world right now uh, that will drop in, I think, a matter of weeks. Looks badass, actually. And so we were, I'm proud to say, one of the first brands, we brought L'Oreal into the metaverse, their first foray into gaming with an in-game experience in Roblox last year. Um, it's kind of a challenge when you're going in with a sensory brand, whether it's clothes or makeup or fragrance, and we've successfully crushed all of those with L'Oreal's experiential for them. Um, we brought in a million people, I think, in the first five days that came through to engage with makeup in a digital platform. And I think the power is there as we begin to progress there and understand how do we then convert those people that are there, but right now for a brand awareness tool, and it's, I think it's really powerful and interesting. Um, Web3, I think we're in a 2.5 right now, as I hear a lot of people much smarter than me about this next era uh, talk about. It. I don't think we're quite at three yet, but on our way. Awesome, did we have? Yeah, I, have, I just had a quick question. It sounds like you all have dream jobs uh, for marketers uh, with all of the exciting and innovative things that you get to do. And I'm just curious, um, and you mentioned it a little bit with uh, the the 100-year-old brands that you're working with. What do you, what, how do you get a more traditional brand that you're working with to really come on board with some of these ideas that I imagine think they think are a little crazy? <laughs> and um, what do you, what are some tips for helping uh, more traditional brands kind of embrace a lot of these new tactics that are so successful for you. And though the, though I'm sure the, the data and the results speak for themselves, still, you know, I'm sure there's hesitation. So just tips you have for that. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to it because I think UGG is one that has been more traditional in its approach. To, um, to marketing and coming into the organization. I spent 15 years prior at L'Oreal, which, you know, leading, cutting edge, always driving innovation. And, you know, I think coming into a brand like UGG, which is so beloved, but maybe um, kind of slower to adopt some of those innovations, it was about just having um, small wins and clarity um, and not trying to do too much, right? And so, while I came in um, with this thinking that, okay, there's like so much we can do. We need to focus on this like culture consumer. You know, we need to ramp up our influencer marketing. We need to do more amplification on social. We need to go into metaverse and web three. And it was like, yeah, we can't do all that. So let's, let's figure out and prioritize what we're gonna do. What are the learnings from the first thing that we do? Then we can go into the next thing. So sometimes it is a little bit more, um, linear to gather momentum as you're going into it. So now that I think we've really honed in on this consumer that's really the cultural creators that are driving change and making things, we've seen a, a, a huge uptake in our business from the social kind of amplification of communities. So that's really working. On the Web3 and the metaverse, I didn't speak about it because we ultimately decided not to prioritize it because we wanted to make sure we had some good wins here first in the in the communities that we were building, but it's definitely a part of the roadmap. And so I think that's what's really important is just having a roadmap and being really clear about what you're trying to achieve at each point. Um, and so there is a fair amount of, um, you know, galvanizing, getting people on board. And the only real way to do that is having successes, having wins, gathering momentum, getting more people on board with that change effort. And the more people see that momentum, you know, it's hard to stop momentum, right? Because then it's like, well, what's next? Are we going to keep that going, right? So I think that's the way that I've been able to do it, and, and I'm still on that journey. So I don't I know if anybody it's else that test has and to, learn mentality, yeah. right? To steal a tech term, right? Um, little way, I love that. I can't even add more to that, Carol. Yeah, that's exactly MVPs. right. MVPs. 
All right, thank you guys so much. That was fantastic. Let's give them a hand. Thank okay. You.